Good morning. Um, welcome to all of our friends, members and associates. Um, this is the fourth in our series of Artists Beyond the Studio, um, talks that we've been organising um, during lockdown. And I have to say we're very pleased with the response that we've gotten to the talks. Um, it's lovely to see so many people coming and and the lovely feedback that we're getting. Um, today, I'm very happy to introduce you to one of our newest uh, members of Graphic Studio Dublin. Michelle Hetherington is a multidisciplinary artist from Dublin. While studying for her master's at, in fine art at NCID, she completed the etching classes at Graphic Studio Dublin and she became a member here in 2018. Since graduation, Michelle has exhibited at Palace Projects, Graphic Studio Gallery and Lismore Castle, as well as a solo exhibition in November 2019 at Swords Castle. Her work incorporates drawing, photography, painting, video, sound and installation uh, and sound installation alongside her printmaking. I've seen Michelle's printmaking practice develop at Graphic Studio Dublin over the past few years, and she has embraced the rigours of the process in this short time. She has employed etched line, aquatint, spitbite, dry point and carborundum to achieve poetic abstract pieces that manage to maintain some of the immediacy of her notebook work. In 2020, Michelle began to work in the studio on some edition projects uh, as part of Graphic Studios, commissions and visiting artist programs. This has provided her with experience working alongside artists, printers and master printers to further hone her skills. I'm interested in hearing about how Michelle has found this transition from student to professional artist and how Graphic Studio Dublin and her printmaking practice fits in with her wider artistic practice. Often we see only one facet of our members' work processes as so much other stuff happens outside the studio. Michelle is a prime example of this, and I'm intrigued from following her on Instagram by her prolific notebook work, paintings and photography, which explore timekeeping, rhythms and mark making. I want to hear more about what Michelle gets up to when she's not making prints at Graphic Studio Dublin. I will start off with the very first um, installation that really struck me um, and has stayed with me that I created in UCD. So Fermit's Piano is what it was called, and it was a collaboration project with um, Imro Boyle, um, who is the, the resident um, artist in UCD, and she had a program um, called Tunneling. And Tunneling was basically um, a connection between artists, artists and scientists and science students. And this, I didn't know it at the time, but from kind of reflecting, it's really, really impacted on my my process and my practice as a whole. So I was paired up with two science students, um, one theoretical physicist and the other was uh, physics with astronomy and space science, um, which was incredible because even though um, science and art, they're both ex um, exploring, you know, different things and, and new ideas and um, the, the thinking that kind of do between the two minds is very, very, very different. And um, so it was really, really interesting to work with these two students. Um, and we ended up making um, this installation here, Fermat's Piano. And basically what the, the concept behind it um, was to do with Fermat, who was a 17th century um, physicist, um, who basically um, proposed the principles governing um, the, path ray, the paths of um, light rays. And so the, this, the piece was basically a concept um, adapting simple and um, kind of geometrical optics um, and how light travels in a straight line. So it was actually suspended um, throughout the staircase of UCD. And if you kind of were walking around the space, you wouldn't necessarily notice it. It was un only until you looked up that you really noticed kind of these kind of small, really, really fine, thin lines. Um, and it illuminated then when the sun shone on it. So it was extremely delicate, um, very, very minimal. Um, it was actually made up of five kilometers of clear wire. Um, then it also had 28 retort clamps um, borrowed kindly from the, the science lab. Um, and basically this was my very first installation, but also my, an introduction into performance. And it was not, wasn't necessarily a performance piece, but the installation for me became a performance. We did it over three or four days and it was repetitive, constant up and down stairs, threading back down, up and down. And this, that, that performance piece or that kind of install and method 
stuck with me. And I didn't know why at the time, um, but it, it definitely, definitely did. So I was at the time in uh, undergrad uh, printmaking. I had only made a very, very small amount of uh, print works because I was in the three year um, degree. So the first year you kind of explored every, every, everything of fine art. Um, and then you broke down into your second year into technical, the technical aspects of print. And then third year you did your own self-directed. So I did very, very little uh, up to this point of printmaking itself. And so the, the, the minimalism of this piece actually influences the rest of my work. So I'm going to go on then to my, my, my undergrad um, piece. This consisted of six really large scale uh, photography pieces and a sound and video uh, installation. The kind of concept had been brought then from Fermat's Piano about repetition and time performance. And then I had also integrated um, the landscape into it because I started doing readings to do with the landscape and um, how it's actually a metaphor for the subconscious. So I started to kind of think of it um, a little bit more, the, the landscape more um, and performance and how they, how they integrate. So the photographs were um, there, but what happened was I actually became more and more interested in the performative um, video and sound um, elements. So I actually then applied for, I kind of felt like I didn't have enough time um, in the undergrad. I, I just felt like the, the course was too short to really expand on what I really wanted to, to get out of college. Um, so I signed up for the master's. Um, and the video and sound um, piece for my undergrad was the springboard and the entrance into um, my master's studies. Um, I, as I, I mentioned, I do a lot of sound installation, but for the purpose of Zoom, I don't feel like it's really um, right to, to share um, sound installation, especially site specific um, uh, sound installation over Zoom just for quality purposes and stuff. So um, uh, just bear with me then. So I went into the masters um, with, again, this idea of repetition, performance, and this is um, from my studio in the Masters called, and it was a, a performance piece called Continuum. And basically it had no start or finish. It was a loop of me constantly going in circles and circles. And this actually sparked off a very um, meditative type of practice um, where repetition and, and meditation in ways um, started to really develop. And with the idea of time, and psychological time. So I began reading quite a lot of um, scientific journals, scientific studies, um, which really um, stays with me today. So I kind of base a lot of my work or projects off something I've read, and then I go and I take that um, on with me. So Time Is um, was another performance piece that I did for um, the Masters, which was then subsequently shown in Palace Projects as part of a two-person show with um, Elaine Granger. And basically this piece was um, created off the concept of a, a study that I had read. Um, it was a, a study of a French um, scientist, again a scientist, um, and it was conducted in 1964, where he basically went into a cave um, underground for I think it was a, a, a few months at least, um, to basically really investigate time without clock time. So really looking at the biological time, um, psychological, and how that affects and impacts on, on the body. So this piece then was a, it subsequently became a 16 minute silent um, video piece of me meditatively walking extremely slowly in and out of this cave and actually this was a really transformative um piece for me it was really really powerful for me personally um but the projection piece um was played in real time there was no editing of of the of the time so the viewer actually sat um for 
um, in and around four or five minutes watching completely nothing happen, um, which kind of tested the, the viewer's patience, um, which is exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to kind of make them aware that we're very led by time and that there is other, other modes that you can explore. So this piece um, really, again, was very, very important. So this is it um, installed. I installed it on a curved, a curved wall. Um, I had again began reading more about time, and I studied the brief history of time by Stephen Hawking at the time, and I kind of adapted this this way of working of reading and drawing at the same time. And basically, I used drawing um, to understand and to kind of get my get, kind of grasp the concept or grasp the emotion or thought behind the writing. Um, and this actually leads then on to how I make my prints and my drawings and my paintings. They're all very, they're, they're coming from readings or thoughts, but they're, they're ex expressive. They're me trying to figure out um, uh, an emotion or, you know, um, that, that type of thing. So the curved wall was actually um, a mark I had made while reading Stephen Hawking's um, Brief history of time, where it is actually his diagram or him explaining the diagram of um, the beginning or the Big Bang, the this beginning of time to the collapse. So it, I drew basically an arc, and I repetitively drew the arc, trying to understand and how this theory could possibly be, um, how how he could even think of this. So it became a curve, and the the piece was then projected um, onto a curve um, curved screen. So then I kind of moved on and my, this is my final, my master's um, final show. It was called the, the Moon Understands What It Means to Be Human. And it was a two part um, installation. One room was, was this one here, um, which was very much kind of embodying, again, an, more theory, but it was Freud's theory of the subconscious. So the projector, is um, projecting onto brick, which symbolized the body, the, phys the physical body. Um, and then I'll show you in a second, it's actually projecting a, um, a manipulated 35 millimeter film photograph, um, which then there's a piece of glass on top and the light is from the projector is hitting the glass and illuminating the text piece um, on the back wall. So the text piece is a poetry piece um, that I had written, again, trying to understand time and the kind of the poetry behind seasonal time. I kind of starts to move more into the landscape and seasonal time and um, the moon and uh, tides as well. So that's the left hand side of the installation. The right hand side of the installation then was a, um, a moon uh, video. Again, real time, the viewer watched the moon cross the sky in real time. Again, to kind of symbolize or kind of ask the viewer honestly, to, to take time to really kind of make time for this, this piece and this piece alone, not to kind of be rushing or what checking their watch or, you know, really just slow down. So this is another, this is a detail of it, but this is the piece. This is the, the photography piece. So it is a landscape flipped, inverted, um, Again, the physical kind of to represent the physical body. And then the black dots um, were another layer of 35 mil film um, wedged on top. And it was to symbolize the subconscious or the fleeting um, body. So kind of a, a, almost like a, a, a portrait or a, a self portrait of, of, a, of a body, but in a, a lot more abstract form than I would have ever uh, thought of. It's one of the, the moon and I the uh, video piece that was nine minutes long and it was a, a blood moon. It was absolutely fascinating um, to shoot and to show it was, it really, it was stunning to watch. The other part of the um, master's installation was a, a sound and um, performative video. So the the whole installation was a two room that divided, that was connected together, but it was actually um, at the end, the very end of a very long corridor. So the viewer, before they even got to the space, would hear the calling of the, 
of the sound, calling them down into the dark um, space. And basically the this performance piece, Corrupt the Innocence or Disturb the Swaying Mantle of Silence, was again playing off the idea of the time is piece. Um, and it was a hypnotic body going down into the, the earth. But this time it was more to do with the internal. Um, the viewer was brought in to the space down underground with the, the subject. And again, it was, it was very hypnotic. The sound was quite enchanting. Um, and again, it was to kind of dissociate the viewer from the outside world and just um, stop and think for a second of, of the time that they, that they are in currently. So, so after the masters, I was lucky enough um, to be awarded the Fingal Arts um, Graduate Award. Um, and this was in partnership with Block T. And this period of time, really for me, I kind of proposed that I wanted this to be a reflective time um, to kind of take a take a, a moment to look back at all my work that I had done and to kind of see where where I was going. So this is the point where I actually took out my print portfolio and I was kind of like, OK, I do want to get back into the print department. Um, but again, I hadn't made any prints. I was more obsessed with the, the repetitious time labor involved and I think that's what held me toward to the, the print department but not actually make any prints it was the the idea of of the I guess of of the act of or the act of, of printmaking so this award really got me to to stop and to look and it was the first time I had ever um applied for the RHA with a print so I had never shown print works before publicly. Um, and then I also decided to apply for graphic at the same time. So that was kind of this, this year was really me kind of thinking about what I'm going to do next. And um, so that was one part of the, the award. And then the second part of the award was a solo show. So I needed to kind of think towards that. And I really had in mind, again, the Fermat's piano piece. Um, purely for the site specific nature of it. I really enjoyed it and um, it could only be in that space. And so I chose um, Swords Castle, which is um, my, I'm from Swords, so it, it's very local to me, um, but it's also historic. Um, so that was like the, 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 the location that I had chosen. And I knew I wanted to do something to do again with sound, but this time with no visual. So being, um, interested in time, sound is very, very different than sound and, and visual, because you really, you are really, really asking a lot of the viewer to, to stay put um, and kind of make their own visuals because I'm not giving you any, you, you are really kind of testing. So I came across this picture um, and it was of two scientists again, and it was, it wasn't the image or the scientists or the fact that they were in a lab that interested me. It was actually the sign on top of them that really got, got me thinking. I was like, why would they have a sign that says, talk softly, please, in a lab? It made, it, to me, it, it, it kind of was like, I don't, I don't get it. So I then obviously did some more research and it, I came across the idea that what they were working with was um, microsonically very sensitive. And the idea that the scientists' voices um, could greatly impact their environment and the materials that they were working with. So I kind of took that as a springboard for my sound installation and the site-specific nature of the uh, Swords Castle. So, excuse me. So the, the 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 sound piece at Swords Castle um, was very very silent. There was a lot of pauses. But then there was also extreme noise that shook the building, that shook the windows um, purposely to kind of make you aware of where you were, which was very, very interesting. So this is um, just images of, of the piece. I had text, I had text piece or poetry piece um, in it as well. And I also had 30 um, durational paintings, which had 
kind of been born from me bringing back my portfolio, my print portfolio, and kind of exploring that that visual language and reading and and making marks as I read. So they were very much like diary entries um, that I kind of laid flat out for the viewers to see. I didn't give any kind of indication as to what they were. They were very, um, very much just almost small little indications um, or small little visuals so that they could focus on while the sound was completely silent. Um, some of them are completely clear. Um, I washed off a lot of the paint um, after almost like a, an erase, erasing the, the thoughts or the memory that I had of that day. Um, so very minimal. My, my language is, is quite minimal for, um, for print paint and uh, for drawing. So this is kind of just a, um, a detail view of it. Um, I had also a small sculptural piece um, on the floor, which was made of plaster. And I purposely made it very brittle so that if it were to be walked too close to or anything like that, it would collapse. And that was totally fine. Um, during my exhibition, Fingal Arts Council had their five year plan launch and it actually was um, hit and it collapsed and it broke. Um, but it was lovely because after that launch had happened, the, the broken kind of dust pieces off of the, the plaster had been left. So the traces of the person had been left because they had interfered or made their, their mark on, on the space without them even knowing. But it was just for me, I, I, I really, really enjoyed um, that kind of concept that you could maybe not really realize that you're making an impact on your environment. Um, so just to think, to think of that. So my printmaking practice then, um, as I said, kind of leads from a lot from reading and um, mark making and thoughts. So this is kind of what my visual language looks like. And my printmaking practice prior to um, Fermat's piano was based a lot on photography of the landscape, which I went out with a film um, camera and also a pinhole camera. So you can see the top one is a kind of a dissolve of the landscape. So I was kind of trying to um, almost abstract the landscape. Um, I didn't, I didn't really know why, but it was, this is what I was kind of compelled to kind of make, but it, subsequently when it was transformed into printmaking, it was that repetitive submission or submersion into the acid bath and swaying it in the acid that really then reignited the, the repetitious laboursome um, kind of thing that I was interested in. Um, the bottom right hand drawing is the drawing I was talking about that I had produced for when, or while I was reading the um, Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. So that's the drawing that I and I made multiple, multiple drawings um, while reading, which has, as I said, stead, stead with me. These are just some of my printmaking. Um, my prints that have um, only recently kind of I've started to show publicly. Um, I don't know why I kind of held them to myself. It was almost like I didn't want to let them go for some, for some reason, they were quite personal. Um, but that's kind of what the visual language um, translates to from the, the, the pinhole um, photography. So kind of leading up now to, to 2020, um, and I was lucky enough to be awarded the Fingal Arts Bursary. Um, and what I had in mind for the bursary was print pure print, nothing, nothing else, no sound installation, no, no, nothing. And I actually had the 60 year um, of graphic in mind when I applied. And I wanted to basically use the whole year, whole of 2020 to experiment um, with just the idea um, of having one print at the end. So, um, to start that, or to start that process, I looked at the title that the show had been given, which was Diamond Point. Um, and I kind of solely focused on the word diamond. And I started looking at the potential behind the word and the kind of the words that are associated with, with diamond. And 
I actually became more interested in the opposite. So irregular, um, murky, earthy, soft edge, dark um, kind of objects. And I came across um, this guy, um, Proteus, which is one of Neptune's 14 moons and only was recently discovered because it is so dark um, in the solar system that it was, it was missed. Um, so I found that really, really interesting that um, something could be so huge in the solar system but be missed because it's not shining brightly. Um, so it was kind of almost a, a nod to the imperfect or, or kind of acknowledging that it's not, you don't always have to be um, perfect and it, with printmaking you certainly need to be um, open for mistakes and, and errors and, and that type of thing. So this piece really for me was, was kind of a nod to that and to kickstart my, my visual language in printmaking. But sadly, COVID had a, had a different uh, idea. Um, I did get into the studio on our designated days to, to make it, but um, sadly that's kind of where my printmaking for the year kind of finished purely because of COVID. Um, but I was a great grateful for Neve and, and Robert for allowing me to do some um, additional work with, with you guys um, to kind of get, get more of a feel for the, the studio. Um, but as you see from this, this piece, there's a lot of small indentations um, etched lines, which again were a lot more repetitive, um, which I, di I did employ um, within the, the print itself. I show a lot of um, details in even on my um, on on the show or the the presentation because I purely want people to look at the small details. I want to to make people aware of the little overlooked things that they may not um, may not take into account. So this is not the full the full print. Um, it's just a, a small little close up just to show you the details um, of of the work. And as you can see, there's small little repetitious um, circles and, and arcs and stuff like that, which again carries through. So once COVID hit and I set up a little home studio, um, something that kind of caught my attention was the water. I, it's the, the ocean and the sea is sadly just that small bit outside my 5K, um, which is very, very annoying. Um, so I made a, a series of paintings um, exploring um, the movement of water. And that repetitious um, meditative state in which I found myself making these was bliss throughout COVID. It, it really, it has really been nice to be able to go inward um, and express motion and, and emotion um, through making a mark making. So my notebooks, as Neve said, she's interested in, um, as I kind of mentioned with the, the solo show, they're very much diaries, um, but they're not handwritten. They're not um, written uh, diaries as such. They're visual emotion, um, fleeting notices of, of say sunlight or a little dust particle that floats by. I, I draw that emotion that I see or that I feel when something small um, in time happens to me. So they're very, very personal, um, but uh, they're always there. I, I go through a lot. I think a lot. <laughs> so um, I, yeah, I go through a lot of a lot of notebooks. And so that's kind of where I am now. I'm, I'm still at the home studio um, making uh, prints or making paintings, which actually I've never painted before. So since um, COVID, I picked up a paintbrush. So I, I'm by no means a master at uh, anything. Thing, but I'm really, really enjoying that kind of focus and um, just getting getting in touch with with myself because I kind of can't really do anything else. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that's kind of my my practice and um, where I am at currently. Uh, really, really lovely talk. Thanks so much, Michelle, for, for all those amazing insights. Um, I, I, I'm sure people have loads of questions. I've got, I've just got one kind of, it's almost an observation, but the, the marking time thing is, you know, it's been there since before COVID and it's really, it's really interesting concept, but I'm just wondering, like everyone seems to be marking time at the moment. You know, we're all, we're all here marking time with no kind of end point. It's almost like being in some kind of, like it's like a prison sentence where we don't know the end. 
And I'm just wondering, has that come into your, you know, during lockdown, has the mark marking of time or the passing of time, has that changed in any way since you were doing it back before all this happened? Or? Mm. That's a good question. Um, has it changed? It has changed in a sense of the medium has changed, but I think, I think it's kind of stayed the same. I haven't had any difficulties kind of being able to make work, which I'm, I feel I feel quite lucky to, to be able to kind of continue. I've no kids or anything like that. So I, I'm able to just solely throw myself in and, and mark my day. Yeah, so your practice hasn't changed, I guess. You're, you're, you, you've been able to. Consider. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, my practice has changed slightly as in obviously I'm not able to do any installation work or, or anything like that. And I would draw a lot of inspiration from the landscape and being in, you know, immersed in woodland or as I said, on, on, the, on the beach. Yeah. And at nighttime, I love moon watching. Um, it's something really, really fascinating. Now, obviously I can do it from, from home, but I do like to do it from Hope Head normally. <laughs> um, but again, outside my 5K, so I can't, I have to kind of. You said that you kind of went from printing to painting over lockdown. And I've, I've actually done the same. Um, I was wondering how, how you're kind of finding it. Um, I was like, it's such a different medium compared to printing, you know? Yeah, um, funny enough, printmaking makes you slow down a lot and painting has kind of brought an immediacy and um, like drawing does but it's it's almost kind of made me think of different mediums within printmaking that you can adapt that to so carborundum for example and um, so I have a few carborundum plates ready to go so whenever we do get in and um, so the transition has been has been I mean it's been d different um but the flow I, I use I'm used to working with um spit bites so the flow of, of printmaking um and or that type of printmaking and painting isn't too dissimilar for me um so it's kind of been been okay but um the change has been yeah it's it kind of like everybody else you kind of have to just adapt it, it's interesting actually the the like you talk about spit bite and for people who don't know that that's where you're painting on with the acid on the on the plate and you get a, an almost like a watercolory soft mark and it's the kind of thing that in painting is super quick mm -hmm. and then when you're doing it on a copper plate like you know um it takes half an hour 45 minutes to just get one sort of seemingly um fluid quick looking mark you know so it's quite it's quite an interesting observation in in, in the context of your work mm, yeah and it can be frustrating um spit bite can be definitely frustrating especially when i want like a pure solid black um that's <laughs> that can take multiple multiple goals tricky mistress yeah absolutely <laughs> uh, looking at the painting there um obviously you've introduced a huge element and that's color more so than you would have been using before and how are you finding that yeah that um i'm not gonna lie um i was scared of color for a very long time um being introduced to the printmaking department in ncad in undergrad i didn't touch color at all and um, it was very black and white and i used black and white photography and i wore black all the time and it was just no color whatsoever and um, so so color is definitely something that is very new to my practice um, but I tend to be very methodical with the way that I choose my, my color. I don't just choose a color because it's handy. Um, I definitely have to think about everything. Everything for me has to have a reason, a why, a concept. Mm. Um, that's just the way that I work. And I find that it makes most sense to me. So deep, rich blues, um, again, symbolizing water or the midnight sky, that, that type of thing um, is very much... Kind of creeping in now but it's again only since i've started painting really that has that's that's crept in and it's subsequently leading into or creeping into my printmaking practice um you you talk a lot about scientists and and writers and um, that have inspired your work but are, are there any artists that that like you'd always kind of look at and that you'd refer back to hmm. Yeah, um, I only really <laughs> recently actually copped that it was all scientists that I was looking at. I didn't, it was just kind of a thing that I did and I was like, oh my God, they're all scientists. Um, but the artist that I would definitely look at would have been Agnes Martin. 
mm. um, and side tumbly just for the immediacy and which and the, the repetitious marks that they make and the huge large scale um, which I never ever have done I've never done anything large and um, simply because because my notebooks are so personal my work translates to quite personal and and I stay within like a almost like a page a notebook page um format so um those are the two artists that I really admire with their visual language um David Quinn and the Irish artist David Quinn as well um, um and then for science purposes um Katie Patterson um I for my master's thesis I wrote about her work um and she has a, a project ongoing for the next 100 years um, to do with a forest that she's currently building to make a library because in 100 years she's not sure if we're going to have books and so she wants to make um, a library there um, accessible for the next generation so she would be very much someone I would look towards um, as well she and um, has nothing to do with printmaking at all she's a, an installation an installation artist but yeah they're they're the kind of the main the main four that I would kind of look towards. Great, thanks. And I just have one more question. You use um, pink a lot, like that really soft pastel pink. Is that, where, where does that come from? Seeing as you said that the blues come from the sea and the sky. Mm. Um, again, that was kind of a surprise to me. Um, I think it was a, a shade of the sunset that I had seen. Um, and again, it was probably pulled from the sky, that, that, that color. It, it um, I had a series kind of during lockdown of exploring that that kind of pink, um, which after a while I absolutely hated. Which I think is a, which is a good thing because you need to go through ebb and flows of of loving and hating your work to to develop and make it stronger. But that was definitely a, a shade of of the sky that I had seen, which I take note of a lot, and and I, I take a lot of photographs of and um, passing clouds and stuff like that, things that are ephemeral. Um, around me, um, which I kind of can choose the, the colours from, but may, I'm mostly interested in the, the transitional times of night and where it's dusk, so darker kind of um, colours that I'm most interested in. I'm just wondering, Michelle, do you have any particular advice for people who are just finishing up college now? Mm -hmm. what, what did you focus on that you felt has really made a difference? Yeah, um, I definitely think um, having some sort of direction or plan and um, and I don't mean like big plans I mean like either if you're in a printmaking department to join a printmaking studio don't let it go like don't don't give yourself like as you say like a year out or two years out because the likelihood of you you know going back it, it gets harder um, and it was another reason why I did the masters straight after was I wanted to keep in that rhythm and I want to again rhythm or repetition but I want to keep in that kind of that flow um, I worked towards, um, I guess I, I, I worked towards um, making more, um, more proposals and, and kind of trying to get a grip of my, my practice from a, a theory point of view to write proposals. So if, if that kind of makes sense to kind of, the art making is important, but the why for me really you need to understand to to kind of push forward and be able to have momentum to keep going because I've I found with my undergrad class um or for me when I was in the undergrad I was kind of a get, getting a little bit deflated um and it was it was kind of time for me to evaluate what I needed to do next in order to to keep to keep going so a plan like a, a small but unrealistic plan um but for me it was um applying for the award and applying to graphic that were there were my two um my two goals as such um that I had set for myself and then to apply for funding and you know all that came afterwards but um definitely to just keep in touch with your medium as such was very important I would say important yes. I have a question mm -hmm. um hi Michelle thanks that was brilliant um it might be two questions actually um <laughs> I love your work. I, I really love it. I love how minimal it is and I love how it relates to landscape in this kind of stretched apart way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not directly, it doesn't look like something landscapey, I guess, which I really love. And I, I wanted to know if, 
how you approach landscapes because you know with the cave and the night sky and that kind of how landscape features in it and then my second question which might also be related to it is how would collaboration inform your work or do you see your work in any way collaborative or is there a future collaboration that you would be interested in doing or do you see it as a collaboration between you and the what you're kind of looking at mm. um so how i would have, your first question was how do i approach yeah um, so I quite, I'm very, people think, people say I'm, I'm quite a, d a deep thinker um, and quite philosophical in, in my thoughts. So how I kind of approach the landscape is quite poetic and I will take notes um, or photographs of the landscape in, that I find interesting or that spark kind of deeper thought, um, which I will then go and reflect on. So I don't ever work directly from the landscape I don't go out with a sketchbook or or anything like that and it's always like a an after an after kind of digestion I guess of what I've seen and then I output after almost like kind of trying to understand trying to understand the world around me it's a very complex a complex um place that we're in and it's I guess that that's why I need to be I need to go out in order to gain those thoughts and then come back so that's kind of a thing that I've kind of struggled a little bit with with um, with lockdown is I love my 5k but it's you can it's you know I need more and um, secondly your second question I hope that answered a little bit of it um, the collaboration I have never collaborated other than um, the firm at the piano um, piece um, but I think it because I haven't collaborated up to now is because it's been very personal. Um, and it's almost like you're working through things yourself um, and you don't need, or you, not that you don't need other people, but you, it's like, it's hard to let other people in to, to a, a space in which you are trying to, to understand yourself. So I would definitely say that I've kind of gotten to that stage now where I understand what I'm doing um, and therefore I would be open to to seeing what happens with bringing another voice in and kind of bouncing ideas um, or creating a piece with another artist. Um, I would be very interested in doing some sort of sound installation outside. I see a lot of, of, of collaboration with me in the landscape, if that makes sense. Love your work. Thank you. It's really um, interesting and uh, thought provoking. And I'm just wondering um, now that you're working from home, do you have a structure to your day? Um, I know when you're going into the studio, you kind of are probably working to a timetable, and um, but it's different when you're at home. Your time is your own, and also the work that you're doing at the moment, your paintings, um, will that connect to your print work when you go back to the studio? And um, will the paintings that you're doing now transfer into prints at some stage? Hmm. Um. <laughs> I'd love to say I had a structure to my day, but um, I really don't. I, that. <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, it works in ways. It's good to not have a structure in, in certain aspects because I can find sometimes working to a, a too strict a schedule can be um, a recipe for artist block um, and where you kind of go, oh, I can't, I can't create. Um, I often get my most deepest thoughts at nighttime, um, kind of like that, in between time before after dinner and before you go into bed that's mm. the time in which my brain is like okay let's go so in a way that's loosely my schedule of i kind of allow my brain to 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 be on at that time but throughout the day then i kind of i'm, I'm taking in my environment during the day so part of my schedule is just to be and just to kind of allow um things to impact on me and i note them or i use my notebook to to work them through but usually nighttime is kind of when I start kind of making. So I find it interesting, actually, my, my studio at home is actually in the kitchen. Um, it is a, just a desk at the kitchen, but at the morning time, once I've done work at nighttime, I leave it obviously there to dry or whatever. And then I come down in the morning and the sunlight is is illuminating it, which I then look at it again in a different a different way. So I'm, I'm quite interested in, in that in, in also ways. But in yeah. relation to the painting, and printmaking, I, as I said earlier, I'm actually kind of starting to make carborundum plates 
um, to bring into the studio, as I kind of find that the immediacy of the carborundum um, tran will translate well from my paintings, but I'm, I'm cautious to not have a painting and want to turn it into a print. Mm -hmm. I, I never really, I don't like that idea because you kind of al almost have a fixation that you need it to look like the painting, yeah. uh, which they're totally different mediums and you kind of need to not have that um, to be able to just let go and into the process or into the, pr the printmaking process because printmaking has so many different variables that you need to be open-minded when you go into the studio. Mm -hmm. So I'll have the paintings there as kind of reference, but um, Carborundum is where it's going to be at for me, I think, going, going forward. Can I ask you about the medium you're using in your paintings? They seem to have lovely surface, lovely texture to them. Mm -hmm. um, so my paintings have multiple, multiple, multiple layers. I mean, I again use them like notebooks, um, but I never change the page. So I continuously use the same surface over and over and over and over and over again. So there, there will be little details or hidden um, little suggestions of the painting prior um, left um, scene, kind of like a palimpsest. Um, there, there's those, those that history, that history is kind of left on the surface. So the texture is actually built up from multiple days, weeks of, of painting on the same surface. So I've only recently started to use oil. Um, so the, the painting that you're seeing at the moment is um, oil and oil stick. But um, yeah, they're, they're quite heavy, heavily layered. And I also wash off paint as well. Um, kind of like a clearing of the day. If I've had a bad day, I actually physically wash the paint off, which can kind of seem like a bit of a waste, but it works for me to kind of clear my head for the next day. Hi, Michelle. Um, I just have a question about your interest in, in science. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the... Uh, references you made um I would consider to be like quite heavy in uh like for just a general interest in science so I was wondering did you, do you have someone in your life that maybe has sparked that interest I know for myself my brother would be quite interested in those kind of things and we'd have conversations about that so I was just wondering how you became so interested and where you find your references from hmm. um do you ever have you ever heard the the kind of thing of when someone tells you you can't do it you're like i'm going to do it so when i was in school in secondary school um my science teacher didn't like me um for some reason i didn't do anything to her but she she was like you're not going to take science in um the leaving cert um i think you'd be better off um going to geography so i kind of listened to her kind of being that that young girl um but it actually kind of stood with me when she was like, you're not going to do science. And I was like, but I'm really interested. And, but for some reason I allowed her voice to, to dictate my, my path. And it kind of has only been since I've kind of taken ownership of what I should be interested in or what I would like to be interested in that I was like, actually, no, it is science that I'm interested in. I am very, very, um, curious and I think that's with a lot of artists the, the curiosity is the key you have to have that curiosity to, to to look at things explore things and and that for me was through through science and the the project with UCD and the um, the two collaborative um, the science students was just the start for me I was I was immersed in the science building now I don't like the the, cl the the clinical nature of the of the science building or anything like that. I do need the studio to be expressive, but it's the way that they think and how nothing is impossible to them that I just I just love. And that's where I kind of was like, nothing is stopping me from picking up a science book and reading it. Absolutely nothing. So um, I have a lot of books. I I read constantly from every every topic and I grab little bits little nuggets and um so yeah I just read I read a lot 